Morning everybody, welcome again to our Wednesday Word. And to start with some good news, our congratulations to John Berman. John is remarrying. His fiance is Heather Sneiman, a long-standing uh, family friend of the Bermans. Uh, and we wish them God's richest blessings for all the years that lie ahead for them. Sadly today, we have a number of people in need of prayer. We need to pray for Bessie Williams, who has had a, had a fall. She had to go to hospital. She's now in quarantine with, uh, with, with one of the Williams' children. So please pray for Bessie and for Basil uh, back at Caster. We also want to pray for John Holland, who also had a fall and has cracked a rib. So please pray for John. And then uh, this morning, uh, Bob Young uh, suffered a stroke. And as I speak to you, he's at Gateway Hospital and they're doing assessments and deciding on treatment. But please pray very much for Bob and for uh, Peggy, Bob and Peggy Young. And then also for Corin Burnley, who's on antibiotics for cellulitis. And for Margaret Persaus, who's going through a difficult time uh, at the moment. We commend all of those dear members of St. Olive's to your prayers. Uh, today. And now we come towards the end of the book of Revelation and thank you for staying with me. There'll just be today and next Wednesday and then we'll move on to something else. And as we come today, we're coming to chapters 19 and 20 and then next week, God willing, we'll deal, deal with chapters 21 and 22. But in this last section, chapters 19 to 22, um, the whole of history has been drawn together. And so it speaks to us about the sovereignty of God, about the glory of God, His power, His love, His sacrifice. And let's begin then by reading chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, and a few verses from verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The first thing we pick up is that the bridegroom is approaching the earth. And so in here in chapter 19... Jesus is presented to us as the bridegroom and the judge and the conqueror. The first part of chapter 19 is another of the great throne room pictures which we see so often in the book of Revelation. It's a scene of the rejoicing multitude, a huge number of people singing hallelujah. Let me just give you a taste of it in verses 1 and 2 of Revelation chapter 19. After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belongs to our God, for true and just are His judgments. And so it continues like that. The surprise this time, as we look at this throne room scene at the start of chapter 19, is why they are singing Hallelujah and praising the Lord. And the answer is because of the coming destruction of the wicked. As someone said to me in a WhatsApp message after last week's study in Revelation, uh, she wrote, it's a joy and, and an encouragement to be reminded that God will bring reckoning to the perpetrators of vicious crimes and evil which seem to pass under the radar in our world today. And that is the exact reason why the martyrs in heaven are singing God's praises in heaven. That is the way that they view and understand matters. Now, how is God's final judgment and reckoning going to take place? We see it in verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. And so the bridegroom, who is Jesus... 
After a long wait, he is finally coming. And what is he like? We see him firstly as a bridegroom, faithful and true. He's coming on a white horse. He is the judge, and with justice he judges and makes war. And he does it, verse 12 tells us, with blazing fire. So he's not only the bridegroom and the judge, he's also the conqueror. He's been victorious in battle. He's coming home, and he's earned the right to three names. He is faithful and true, verse 11. He is the word of God, verse 13. And he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, which is verse 16. And out of his mouth comes the sharp sword, as we saw right in the opening chapter of Revelation. So he's the ruler and he's the conqueror, but he's also the one who saved and redeemed us. And now finally, he's coming. And we will bow before him and welcome him back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So David Pawson says this, The greatest surprise we see in this chapter is a picture of Jesus that we have never seen before. Jesus was not a fighter when he visited earth for the first time, but he will be when he comes for the second time. This time he is not seated on a donkey, but on a horse, which is the warrior's mount. The purpose of his first coming was to save and heal, but the purpose of his second coming is to judge and heal. And so here is Jesus coming to enact what the Jewish people hoped would be the case on Palm Sunday when he entered Jerusalem. They welcomed him as the coming king who would overthrow the Roman government. In fact, the only thing they got wrong was the timing. Jesus cannot come to defeat his enemies until he first has come to die for them. The second point that we see here in chapter 19 and moving a bit into chapter 20 is that the devil and the beast and the false prophet are overthrown. So what did Christ accomplish as he rode out on the white horse? And we can see that as we pick up from verse 19 of chapter 19, that bit by bit he gets rid of the evil trinity, the beast who you might remember back to chapter 13, who is the political dictator, the false prophet, who is the false world religious leader, and of course, Satan himself. And so the beast and the false prophet are removed from the earth forever. And Jesus has won the last war and they are thrown into the lake of fire by the end of chapter 19. And it is a reminder to us that it is an extremely foolish thing for anyone to think that they can fight against Jesus and ultimately get away with it. Or as Don Carson puts it, Revelation chapter 19 is a salutary reminder that God is in absolute control and that he is to be praised for his just judgments on all evil. As we move into chapter 20, verses 7 to 10, we read about the final overthrow of Satan. It's his last despairing fling, and God deals with it, and deals with him, and Satan is finished forever, and he too, in verse 10, is thrown into the lake of fire. And that now leads us, number three, to God's final judgment. And I'm reading in chapter 20, just a few verses from verse 11. Revelation chapter 20 and from verse 11. And then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in them, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now we learn in this paragraph, and we see it in many other parts of the Bible as well, that there will be a day of judgment. Elsewhere it's called the day of the Lord, when the whole human race will be divided into two parts. Those who are in the Lamb's book of life and those who aren't. And there is no third possibility that is mentioned or even hinted at. 
The sad reality is that those who reject Jesus, those who say no to God, will spend eternity without them, without him, sorry. Or as it is bluntly stated in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, I say this with great sorrow and sadness in my heart. And when we uh, speak about uh, these matters of an eternity without Christ, we should do so not only with sadness in our hearts, but with tears in our eyes as well. And the devil certainly doesn't want people to believe it. But as I say, it is a reality that is found in the Bible, and Jesus taught it clearly as well. And so that's why we should share the gospel with great urgency and with great conviction to our friends and family. Let's just think for a moment longer about the devil. He appeared in the third chapter from the beginning of the Bible, that is in Genesis chapter 3. And now he disappears in the third, last chapter in the Bible, in Revelation chapter 20. And so the devil, whose sole purpose is to wreck and ruin the human race, is to be utterly removed from the scene. So let's keep all the truths of Revelation chapter 20 in mind. Christ will reign, judgment will come, the human race will be divided, there is a lake of fire. But, as verse 12 says, there is also hope, great hope. Yes, there will be one day the courtroom of judgment. There will be no witnesses. There will be no jury because God knows the whole truth. And then the books which record every person's life are opened. Everything has been recorded faithfully and honestly and impartially. And then the wonderful news, the good news, is that there is another book that will also be opened. And it only has one name on the cover, and that name is Jesus. And as verse 13 of Revelation 20 indicates, across every other book is written the judge's verdict of death. But across this book, the book of life, is written the verdict of life. Because it contains the names of everyone who has believed in Jesus. Their name has been transferred from the book that has their own name on it, to his book. And their name is now in his book. And the amazing thing is that in this book of life, there is nothing but blank pages. How is that possible and how is that just? The day that I believe in Jesus and recognize that my sins have already been paid for in the sight of the judge, and that atonement has already been made, that is the day that my name is transferred from the book of death to the book of life. And so let's pray together. And once again, I'm simply going to pray the sinner's prayer. It's a prayer written by Angus Buchan. Dear Heavenly Father, today I acknowledge that I am a sinner. Thank you for sending your Son to die for me on the cross of Calvary. By faith, I ask you to forgive my sins and to come into my life because of the death of Jesus and also because of his resurrection. All of my sins are forgiven and I am able to start a brand new life today. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us and God bless you all.